Hi, Lucia here from the Witch Money Podcast. Join us each week as we bring you the best experts and top advice to help you make the most of your money. From property prices to budgeting, investment platforms to pensions, we'll be here to keep you informed. Not only that, but we've just launched Money Shorts. These are brand new fortnightly episodes that will give you a taster of the Witch Money magazine that is delivered to members every other month. So to hear the main podcast and our brand new Money Shorts episodes, just search for Witch Money wherever you get your podcasts. Health and beauty products are a staple of our everyday life. From the toothpaste we use as soon as we wake up to the deodorant we use after jumping out of the shower, even the hay fever tablets many of us rely on at this time of year. We're spending hundreds of pounds on stuff that helps us look, feel and smell good. But new research from which suggests you might be needlessly overspending on many of your everyday products. I'm Harry Kind. And I'm Grace Farrell. And this is Get Answers for living your best consumer life. When life gives you questions, which get answers. We're joined in the studio by Sarah Sparry, a brilliant researcher here at Witch, who's carried out a really interesting expose of the wild variations in price that we see in a lot of common health products. Sarah, welcome. Great to have you on here. Thank you for having me. So firstly, can you tell us about your investigation? What kind of led you down this path in the first place? Well, actually, it was a bit of a selfish thing because I just noticed as myself being a shopper that some of the products that I buy are frequently on promotion. So I had a chat with our editor here and we decided it'd be a good thing to look into. We wanted to find out whether or not health and personal care products are frequently on offer. And what we did is we looked at the top supermarkets and we also looked at Boots and Superdrug and we looked at the 13 best-selling categories from toothpaste to deodorants to find out whether or not the leading brands really were fluctuating like we suspected they were. And were they? Yes, they were. So almost universally, actually, we found across the categories that there are like huge variations in price. So an example would be toothpaste. This is one of the products that I buy is often on promotion. So I wanted to see if the data bore that out. And it certainly did. So especially if you're going for more premium toothpaste brands, we found that you could end up paying double depending on when you shopped. So what we did is we looked at thousands of prices across the retailers over a whole year. And we found that definitely toothpaste is a category that fluctuates a lot. Deodorants was another one, as were razors. And condoms actually came out as one that had wild price fluctuations. Almost universally across the board, There are some brands in all of these categories that fluctuate. And what are we talking in terms of numbers here when we talk about these massive fluctuations? So to use an example, if we were to look at toothpaste, we looked at Oral-B sensitivity and gum calm toothpaste, and we found that that fluctuated at every single retailer that we looked at. So the retailers we looked at were Asda, Boots, Morrison's, Ocado, Sainsbury's, Superdrug, Tesco, Waitrose and Aldi and Lidl where the product was available and we found that in the case of this product it fluctuated between £2.50 and £5 so you could actually pay double for that product if you bought at the wrong time. Another example was Colgate Max White Ultimate Radiance Toothpaste which is a more premium brand and that varied by £14.20 at Waitrose so we saw it on uh, offer at at both £11 and £25.20. Absolutely wild variation. I mean, you really could be paying more than double in some of these cases. So it's definitely worth shopping around. Forget about the fluctuation. That's like a crazy high price for toothpaste. Is it like a a five litre tub? No, no, no. It's just a standard toothpaste. But actually, at which we have done quite a lot of research into toothpaste. And we do find that it's one of those categories that we have shown in our research previously, maybe some claims are overblown. So really, if you want to save money on toothpaste, you really just need to buy one that has fluoride in it. Other than that, you're probably just buying for preference. Do you know, I found an old witch magazine, I think from the 60s, which was reviewing toothpaste. And it was saying, I think, you know, it, regardless of which one you buy, it's definitely worth buying a toothpaste and really considering <laughs> adding it to your routine. And I was just like... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good advice. You know, things have moved on. I'm glad to hear. (laughs) Do you think toothpaste is specifically badly affected by this, Sarah? 
No, not at all. So we looked at 13 different categories and 39 brands over a whole year. So we ended up looking at thousands of price points. And we looked at toothpaste, mouthwash, deodorants, razors, soap, shower gel, shampoo, antacids, sun cream, painkillers, cold and flu meds, and condoms. And I think there isn't a category in there that doesn't see fluctuations. Some products actually were actually a bit more stably priced. I'd say that soap and shower gel wasn't too bad, depending on which brand you bought. So if you were going for Radox shower gel, you would expect to pay pretty much the same price across the board, across retailers, across the year. The same with certain soap brands, so Carex and Palmolive as well. We saw those being quite stably priced. Um, Painkillers as well, we didn't see them fluctuate wildly. But actually, for almost everything else, we really did see some marked price increases. And I will just pull out the example of condoms because we were quite surprised by this. So for Durex Real Feel non-latex condoms, we saw them costing both £11 and £18.50 at Waitrose. And also quite wild fluctuations for the same product at Superdrug and Boots. So we saw a price difference of around £5, depending on where they were on offer. So depending on how much you shop throughout the year, you could be spending upwards of £100 more than you need to, for sure. Sound like Valentine's Day? Do you know, we didn't really notice any seasonal fluctuations for condoms, although you might expect, actually, maybe they'd whack the price up at Valentine's Day. But no, we didn't see seasonal fluctuations with that product. We did, though, in some other categories. So one of those categories would be hay fever. So we saw that prices were most competitive over the summer months. I find that really interesting because I would have thought that they pump the prices up when there's really high demand because you you have no choice but to have to buy hay fever medication in the summer. Whereas maybe they drop the prices in the winter and then you could like we could give a little hack where you stock up on, on hay fever meds during the winter. But so that's not the case. It's not the case. And I have to say I had the same hypothesis as you. That's what I thought would be the case, but it's not. Were there any other seasonal fluctuations with the other kind of toiletries and health products that you've spoken about? Yes. So another example would be sun cream. We saw more competitive prices over the summer months for that as well. And the same is true in reverse with cold and flu remedies. So you could find best savings in the winter months, again, when those products are more in demand. But actually, at which we would recommend if you want to save money, don't buy branded cold and flu medications don't buy branded hay fever medications it's really not something you need to do you could save a lot of money just by buying own brands so all you need to do is look for the active ingredient and make sure they're the same and you you could save a lot so like in the case of hay fever medication you'll generally find that the active ingredients either loratadine or cetrazine hydrochloride and what about different shops? Where would you say is the cheapest place to stock up on, on these kind of essentials? Where you might expect for us to perhaps say that the discounters, Aldi or Lidl, were cheapest. We actually couldn't include them for a lot of our research because they stock so few brands. So for the purposes of looking at who's cheapest, we couldn't include them in that piece of research. But the cheapest retailer was Asda. We found that they, out of all the other supermarkets, had the cheapest price for these products most of the time. So Asda followed by Morrison's, Superdrug, Ocado, Boots and Sainsbury's, then Tesco and then Waitrose. So Waitrose was the most expensive for these products. Well, some of you listening at home have been in touch to share how you approach offers at the supermarket. Anita said she never buys non-essential items at full price. She buys double when they're cheaper and tops up when the deal comes around again. Annie said her whole shop revolves around offers and simply, if it's not on offer, we don't buy it. Sarah, do you have any other tips around paying less for health products, particularly if it's something you weren't necessarily expecting to have to buy? Yeah, definitely. I I love both of those approaches. I think they're great approaches to doing your shop. I think it's worth buying double. I think like uh, Anita said, that's a good approach. The only thing I would say is be careful because if you're buying things like sun cream, actually they have an expiry date. So generally after sort of six months to a year, you'd want to replace that. So don't double up on sun cream this year and expect to use it next year. But outside of that, you can certainly stock up when things are on offer. Well, Sarah Sperry, great to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. 
Now, we've got another witch expert on today. We've got Ellie Simmons. She's going to tell us why we're seeing prices changing so much and more shopping habits we can put in place to avoid spending unnecessary money. But first, what are the other tricks supermarkets are using to get us to spend more money? How are they using psychology against us? And is there anything we can do to avoid ending up much more out of pocket than we planned? To help us answer this, I'm joined by Catherine Janssen Boyd. She is a consumer psychologist at Anglia Ruskin University's School of Psychology, and she works with brands and charities and consumer groups on understanding how we make decisions when we shop. Hello, Catherine. Hello. It can feel like, at least when we're giving advice, that everyone is acting entirely rationally and, you know, maximising like almost like a computer when they make any kind of purchasing decision. But it sounds like that there's actually a lot more um, emotion and nuance and a little bit of kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of animal instincts that come into play when we're actually shopping. Don't know if I would compare it to animal (laughs) instincts, but yes, we are very influenced by factors that we don't actually consciously process. And often we underestimate that as consumers. We think we're savvy, we think we're rational, but the reality is the way something is laid out, if you're thinking about a shop, the way it's laid out will actually guide how we walk. We don't think it does because, again, we're not thinking about it. We just kind of follow the structure. So it's very easy to get people to engage in physical settings in particular, because you can use so many different aspects of an environment and even things like auditory input will influence how you perceive something. You can really play around with it and make it work beautifully to subconsciously influence how people do certain things. So what are supermarkets doing then in that kind of physical space to influence us? It actually starts very much with the entrance So when you walk into the supermarket, even how much you buy is controlled by whether you take a basket or whether you take a supermarket trolley. And the reality is that a lot of supermarkets now put their smaller baskets further away so people can't be bothered going to get one. And that ensures they either take the big basket on the wheels or they will grab a trolley because it's easier. And by having something that's a bigger size, it means you're more likely to fill it up because it looks more empty if you only put one or two items in it. And also if you're pulling it along rather than having something physical on your arm, which kind of gives you signals of weight, you actually think, oh, well, there's not that much in there. It's, you know, you don't feel the heaviness. So you keep buying things until you've actually filled it up. So that's the very starting point of it, which is a very common and very basic trick of supermarkets. That's fascinating because you do see, you know, wheeled baskets more and more and in smaller and smaller shops. And it's not necessarily just for your convenience, but also, yeah, as you say, I'm very happy to load up one of those baskets because it's not uh, digging into my uh, elbow. So when you're kind of you've you've got past the baskets, you've maybe managed to select a smaller basket to keep your focus narrow. What might be the next thing that you would be encountering in the supermarket? Well, you would be encountering flowers, fruits, vegetables, because they want to give a fresh impression. So by walking into something that we associate with freshness gives us the illusion that everything in the supermarket is fresh. Now, if you walked into something like a stack of canned goods, for an example, you wouldn't get that impression and you are likely to purchase less because we'd like to think that our food is generally fresh because it's something we're going to consume. Again, this happens subconsciously, of course, but that increases the likelihood of you walking around more and actually buying more because you think things are good in there. So it's a very, very simple trick. And to keep that kind of freshness element going, they usually put bread and the scent of bread further back in the supermarket. So, you you know, first impression is, oh, it's green, it's fresh. And then as you walk further in, there will be a bread corner and often they pump out artificial scent that smells of baked goods. And people then continue to think, oh, this is really fresh. So you kind of have those signals throughout. And it works really, really well because things that are scented in particular are very closely aligned with our memories and our memories usually of freshly baked goods is associated with childhood elements like it could be grandma baking or a parent baking so we kind of think oh this is lovely and makes it feel more relaxed 
And again, the freshness element. So we actually purchase more. Wow. So uh, if you've got, you know, that, that sensory perception of, of smell, you were saying before about a kind of audio input. What are supermarkets doing there? Varied quite a lot, depending on the supermarket. And rather going into each one of them, I'll give you some examples. I actually went shopping recently in a very big supermarket and I got really confused I could hear these bird tweets and I was thinking, hang on, where's it coming from? And I actually thought maybe there was a bird on the loose in the shop. I got really worried because it was so loud. So I kept looking around and I was like, can't see anything, can't see. And then I realized it was actually a tape at the entrance to make you feel more relaxed. So that was just to kind of slow down your pace on entrance to make sure you're not rushing through the doors. Because that's one of the big problems with supermarkets is often you are in a rush. And whilst they can slow you down once you got a bit further in, that initial first 20 or so meters is very hard to get people to slow down. So what's the kind of logic of placement when it comes to products on on these shelves? Well, the most expensive one goes at eye height, which is for most people around 130 centimetres above the floor. Slight variation. So that means that the middle bit of the aisle usually have the most expensive items. Because as you're walking along in the supermarket, you are spending a maximum, and this is absolute maximum, 20 seconds on every product category that you're purchasing. And that is if you're really spending time thinking about it. Most other are far below that. So you're not really thinking about what you're buying. So you're more likely to grab what's at eye height level. And that's why they put the most expensive ones there, because that means you're spending more money. Now, the second most expensive ranges usually go above that because we are programmed to kind of engage in a visual search strategy. That means we start in the middle, I hide, we work our way up, across, and then sort of back down again. And the last thing we look at is the kind of shelving along the floor. And that's why supermarkets tend to put their own ranges, value ranges along the floor, because they don't really make any money on them. We did an experiment of trying to see how many value ranges were available in, in small shops versus big shops. And when I went to the big shops and was buying all the value ranges, as you were saying, I spent my whole time scrabbling around on the floor on these bottom shelves, often, you know, in the most inconvenient places. I do know that people pay supermarkets to have their products positioned in some areas. A very good example of that, Coca-Cola. If you walk down most drink aisles in supermarkets, they will have blocked out a large chunk of it. Now, supermarkets wouldn't kind of present their products taking up half an aisle unless they actually been sponsored to do so. And of course, by doing this kind of block element of an aisle, you know that people are going to buy it because there's very little alternative. I suppose if you're a manufacturer and you can't pay to do something a bit more eye-catching, you still have your own packaging to look more eye-catching. Are there any tricks that designers use that will make them stand out on a, on a whole shelf? We've looked a lot at health and beauty and, and those kind of products and the promotions around them. Are there any tricks in those designs that can get you to buy? There are a lot of tricks. So when designing items, you need to make sure that they have contrast to others. Now, this is a common problem in supermarkets that everything pretty much looks the same, which means that they don't stand out, which means that people are going to grab the things they usually purchase. So if you actually want them to look for something new, you create something that is high in contrast. Of course, this is very difficult to control for manufacturers because if they don't know where their items are going to be displayed, it can be tricky. But novelty, for an example, anything that's a little bit different tends to attract subconsciously consumers' attention and they're very likely to go for it. Equally, things that look aesthetically pleasing, so just attractive items, we know that people generally purchase things that are more attractive than other items. So you can kind of play along with the whole of aesthetics as well as contrast and novelty and that usually helps. But also, which I have worked with manufacturers of various tea boxes on, 
we know that if you can create more of a texture on the box so that it looks visually textures, that can also attract attention because a lot of consumers have a need for touch. They want to touch things, but they don't have time to do that in supermarkets because then you'll be touching everything and you'll be in there for absolutely ever. But seriously, if you can actually do something that looks a bit more textured, then people are more likely to pick it up because it sends them cues that actually this feels a bit different. We've talked quite a bit about deals and and mainly in-store deals where prices are are fluctuating all the time, whether that's seasonally, whether that's seemingly at random. Can you talk a little bit about how, I suppose, our brain processes a deal? Why do supermarkets do it? And what is the, the psychology behind seeing something that's half price or with a big yellow sign on it that says on offer? So... On offer is a great thing for your psyche because what tends to happen is when we see something that we think is good value, the part of our brain which deals with pleasure is activated. So this actually generates a bit of an adrenaline rush, which means that we kind of feel like, oh, we have to have this. And if I don't buy this, I'm missing out because this is a genuinely good deal. And supermarkets and most retail environments know this. So to have big signs saying two for one or 50% off or whatever it might be, it works so, so well. And the bigger the numbers are, the more we go, oh, this is exciting. My brain's telling me that I'm getting a really good deal. Of course, it doesn't mean it's a good deal, but because, again, we're back to this, and it's very important, we are not rational when we're in there because we're spending so little time in the shop and on each product category that we are kind of following rules of thumb. Our brain is telling us one thing, our body is activating adrenaline, that's got to be good. That's what we're going on. And again, very subconsciously, very instantaneously, you're not going to think, oh, let me sit down and have a think about, is this rational? You don't. You just grab it and go. And then the next offer, you have the same response. And what is actually quite phenomenal is that our brain is very fine-tuned because if we see something, we think, oh, that's expensive. The part of our brain that is associated with pain is activated, which will make us back off. So this is why supermarkets need to make sure that proper offers seems to be real because we almost instantaneously know when something is wrong. But we're also not so shrewd that we understand the sort of genuine offers, if you like. Catherine, that's fantastic. Is is there anything else you want to mention? But also, um, where can people read your research and and find you online if that's what you want people to do? (laughs) Well, if people want to find me online, they can find me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect with people, have a bit of a chat. If you want to read more of a general, broader aspect of it, I do blogging for Psychology Today. So that usually is the more easier, lighthearted side of consumer psychology, which people can definitely read a wide variety of elements on. It's been uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. What is happening to supermarket prices? Do own label brands taste good? What's the best supermarket? What's the worst? How do I spend less on my weekly shop? Are there ways I can shop smarter? Should I just be growing my own veg? How do I even grow veg? (sighs) Wine to pair with spag ball? When life gives you questions, get answers at which.co.uk. You're listening to Get Answers. If you want to get involved, our next episode is looking at the smart tech that's playing dumb, aka devices that have woefully short lifespans due to manufacturers no longer supporting them. Tell us your thoughts or send us in questions. Our email address is podcast at witch.co.uk. We'd love to know if you've got any of these brick devices at home. And you can also get in touch with us on social media, of course. We're at Witch UK. And if you're a fan of what we do, take one minute to leave us a review or a rating wherever you're listening. It would mean the world to us. 
We're now joined by the fantastic Ellie Simmons, queen of crunching the numbers when it comes to supermarket prices. Ellie, what exactly is going on here? Why do prices fluctuate so much? There are loads of reasons why prices go up and down loads. But I think what it mostly boils down to is retailers wanting us to buy more stuff. And that could be for reasons such as the shops have got too much stock that they want to shift. Um, It could be that they're trying to be extra competitive with their rival shops. You know, they've seen another shop discount something and they want to be competitive on that. It could be to do with seasonality. And also, I think in, in loads of cases, discounts are just something that's baked into retailers' pricing strategy. So there's a high price and there's a low price. And really, the true price is probably somewhere in the middle of those two prices. And their pricing strategy is that they have a higher price for a bit, a lower price for a bit. And then they hope to make more sales, presumably at the lower price, but some people will still buy at the higher price for a bit as well. But do you know why some products are quite stable? I mean, Sarah mentioned like palm olive, for example, tends to be quite stable through the year, but then you'll have toothpaste brands that go up and down wildly. So why are retailers choosing certain brands and products to fluctuate and keeping others stable? Some of it will be to do with the prices set by the manufacturer. So so the retailers set the prices that they charge to consumers, but obviously they will buy products from manufacturers. And sometimes some of that will be to do with how they buy the product from the manufacturer and what they pay for it. Others will be to do with seasonality and stock, things like that. And it will just depend on the product. There will be different types of discounts and different discounting patterns for different products. Because that was one of the weird things from Sarah's research was that the seasonality is almost counter cyclical, that when you would have the highest demand, that's when you see lower prices, almost the complete breaking the fundamental laws of economics. Sarah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. But I think another thing comes into play, which is competitiveness. So I think the fact is that during the summer months, everyone's trying to sell you sun cream. And so prices will be competitive. But yeah, it does seem kind of counterintuitive. But then I think when you think about it and get your head around it in a slightly different way, it it does make it a different kind of sense. And what about price matching? Because this is something we see a lot now in the supermarkets. And it's certain products will say, you know, this is the same price as Asda, for example. But it is it's just very specific products. So if there's a competitiveness between supermarkets, why aren't all the products kind of price matched? Why is it just certain ones? Like what, what impact do you think this is having on, on people's supermarket shopping? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head really there because if they really wanted to match prices, then they would match them entirely. And it's actually Aldi that most supermarkets match to, some also match to Lidl, but it tends to be Aldi. And to be honest, if I was Aldi's boss, I would be laughing all the way to the bank because what better advertising is there than all your rivals telling everybody that your prices are so good that they're going to match a few of them. I mean, it's fantastic advertising. And and when you think of it, it shows you how much more prices are at all the other supermarkets in general than they are at Aldi and Lidl. I suppose price matching promos are an easy way to, to immediately compare prices when you're in the supermarket. But aside from that, do you have any other tips on how you can actually compare prices when you're walking around the supermarket? I mean, is it a case of, you know, looking at a packet of pasta, getting your phone out and seeing how much it costs at all the different supermarkets? Or are there easier ways to do this? So I think the best advice really is to use kind of general tips to help you save money at the supermarket. And that's things like picking own label products, which generally are cheaper than branded items not being too taken in by deep discounts. Discounts are great on things that you're going to buy anyway. But if you're not thinking of buying those things to start with and you just see a good discount, then you'll probably end up putting it in your basket and you wouldn't have done otherwise and your overall bill will be larger. I think it's also really helpful to have an eye on what generally is the cheapest supermarket. And I've mentioned our cheapest supermarket analysis that we do every month already but that always shows that Aldi and Lidl are the cheapest supermarkets and the others are more expensive so I think that's probably one of the best tips is to know generally how expensive your supermarket is rather than try and get hung up on the individual products. Well that's brilliant advice there Ellie thank you so much. Thank you.
If you're finding the stuff we're talking about useful, there are three really great newsletters I can recommend, and they're all free. One is called The Weekly Scoop. It comes out every Friday and rounds up our latest advice and consumer news stories. The second is The Money Newsletter, which, as you might expect, has more of a money and personal finance focus. And we also have The Food and Health Newsletter, which is monthly and focuses specifically on food, health products and toiletries. We'll pop a link to the sign-up pages for these in the show notes, but you can also just Google which newsletters. Which approached all of the retailers involved in the fluctuating prices story to ask if they wanted to comment on the information about the health products that we mentioned. Boots, Superdrug and Waitrose told Witch that they aimed to offer the best value to customers via a range of deals. The other supermarkets did not comment. A spokesperson from Superdrug said, we prioritise working with our suppliers to secure the lowest cost possible in order to offer the best price for customers. Our regular price promotions, plus our additional members-only prices, ensure our customers can make savings on their favourite products across the year. We regularly compare prices in the market to ensure they're competitive and offer genuine value and savings. Waitrose said, we are committed to offering great value and our offers are really popular with our customers. A spokesperson from Boot said, We are committed to providing great value and unbeatable choice across a huge range of personal care products at Boots. We offer a comprehensive programme of deals and promotions, as well as exclusive prices for Boots Advantage card members to help customers buy the brands they love for less. A reminder to get your questions into us for next time. We're here to help you get answers. Today's Get Answers was presented by me, Harry Kind, alongside Grace Farrell, produced by James Rowe and Adrian Bradley, and edited by Eric Breer. And thanks again to our wonderful guests, Sarah Sparry, Dr. Catherine Janssen Boyd, and Ellie Simmons. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Twenty twenty three was momentous in the fight against fraud. It saw the passing of the Online Safety Act and the Financial Services and Markets Act. Both of these happening after years of exhaustive campaigning from us here at Witch. But the battle against scams is far from over. Stay in the know and avoid falling victim to scammers by joining over 450,000 others who have signed up to our Witch Scam Alerts. To sign up, head to witch.co.uk slash scam alert today.